Kerry Dixon was born in Luton in July 1961. He became a footballing legend at Chelsea and represented his country at the highest level. But not everything he touched in his life turned to gold and after serving four months in prison he now looks to show his family and his many fans that he is entering into a new chapter in his life. It's been quite a journey from his time growing up playing with his friends in the streets of Luton. Growing up in Luton was, uh, it was great. Played in the street, did what every other kid would do. Played with the mates. We had a cul-de-sac uh, in Bodmin Road, whereby um, we used to set up goals on people's drives and put a jumpers down. And It was always football, cricket up against a lamppost. There was about nine or 10 lads out there and a few of the girls joined in, my sister. She joined in a bit of a tomboy and there's a few other girls they, and we all mucked in together. It was, uh, it was quite good growing up. In the summer, you know, athletics, I, was, I wasn't as quick. I think I got quicker as I got older. I was relatively quick, but I was competitive. Um, cricket, love cricket, love, all the games. We used to go around a social club, a big field, and when we could get in, when the groundsmen weren't about. But yeah, it was all pretty much um, make do with, uh, as long as there was a football about, we took jumpers off for goals and, Carried on. In those days, the good footballers played up front, the bad ones were in <laughs> goal. So you imagine you were up front, were you? Oh, I think we all took our turns. I think it was a bit of everything. Dad was a massive influence on your early career and getting you into the game? Oh, both mum and dad. Um, you know, in their own way, dad was an ex-footballer himself, you know, playing at Coventry and Luton and then a host of non-league clubs. But uh, mum was always there supporting him, but he was always there through virtually every game. He'd get off work and early, stand in the rain in his overcoat and watch every game. He'd become my biggest critic as well as, you know, my father and, you know, one of the best people I've ever met on the, in my life. Um, you know, both of them, both the parents were absolutely fantastic and always have been for me. Your first chance to become a pro was at Tottenham and you scored quite a few goals there, which will go through in your career. You scored goals everywhere. You scored goals at Spurs as well, but it didn't quite work out. No, it didn't. Um, it was just one of them things. I think there was a lot of good players around at the time and Tottenham had to make a decision. Billy Nicholson got the casting vote and sadly enough, uh, the great man for Tottenham anyway, and I'm sure great man, decided that uh, it wasn't to be and they went with Mark Falco, Terry Gibson, Jimmy Bolton and some of the other players at the time. Um, all had decent careers so that, you know people made decisions. I'd already had a knockback from Luton and David Pleat was the one there that told me at the age of 16 I wasn't going to get an apprenticeship. So. It was a second sort of knockback in my life in terms of uh, wanting to be a footballer and being told, sorry, go and find another club. But at the age of 16, when Luton told me, because I set my heart on apprenticeship, um, my dad and mum said, you've got to, get a, got to get a job, you've got to get a trade. I went and worked and trained as a toolmaker um, for, f for five years. It was a four year apprenticeship in the factory, um, something which for the first two years at Reading, I ended up continuing because of the knockbacks that I got both at Luke and Tottenham. So, in a way, it possibly learnt me a lesson and it, and it held me in uh, good stead, if you like, but I never went back to being a toolmaker. The moment I walked out, um, I wasn't really cut out for it. I used to, in the summer, look out of the back doors at the sun and think, I've got the oily rags on and full of swarf eager in my hands and stuff like that, and I used to think, this isn't for me and if I get another opportunity I'm going to take it. Kerry's opportunity soon came along when Reading signed him up from his local team. Reading plucked me from non-league, I was playing for Dunstable. A friend of my dad's and my godparent, Brendan McNally, who used to play for Luton, was manager of Dunstable at the time and took me on and I hit it off with a lad called Stuart Atkins, um, a secondary striker as they call him these days, a number 10. And we worked well together, it was the first decent partnership in football terms that I'd had um, as a strike partner and uh, I finished top scorer in, in the Southern League with 52 goals and um, I think he got 37 and finished second. Dunstable finished fourth actually so uh, just one of them things. Scoring all of those goals made him become a popular player for the scouts to watch and in 1983 a host of big clubs were eager for his signature 
including Chelsea, and after chairman Ken Bates personally drove Kerry to Wales for Chelsea's pre-season training, the deal was quickly done. I had the choice at the time. Um, I just top scored in the third division, the old third division, and, and, and Reading had actually gone down. It seems to be a, setting a trend somewhere here, not quite doing so well, but I, I seem to score goals. And um, as I say, Ken Bates coming, uh, went to Aberystwyth. I didn't like pre-season training, and then we, I think under John Neal, when I did sign, we had two training sessions down there, but cool, they were hard, um, hard training sessions. I didn't like pre-season full stop. Uh, anyone who watched me realised I didn't like running, not too far anyway, except if a goal or goal scoring opportunity was on the end of it. But Ken come and persuaded me to sign along with John Neal and uh, one arduous session. I thought, I'm not going back there. He said, you can go tomorrow and sign. Other three clubs were Watford who were continually interested in me. Um, many people thought I would go to Watford under Graham Taylor, who, who were a good side then. You know, John Barnes, Nigel Callaghan playing up front. Uh, very good side, competing in the first division, which is now the Premier League, of course. And Coventry and Sheffield Wednesday were the other two sides who were uh, rumoured to be interested. But nevertheless, um, Chelsea it was, and it was great from the start. I rung up mum and dad and <clears throat> discussed it, and they said, as long as you're happy and you feel you can do okay, and you know, financially it was okay for me. A lot better than what I was on, but yeah. um, nowhere near the money that they're on today, of course. But it, it was decent and it was an improvement, and I was looking forward to the challenge. Chelsea provided Kerry with the challenges he had always looked for as a professional footballer. It also gave him the opportunity to make his full England debut on tour in Mexico City with the likes of midfield maestro Glenn Hoddle. He was a, a goal, he was a goal scorer, he was a finisher. You know, Kerry would always offer himself up. He had good movement, very good in the air, tremendous in the air, and a really, really good pro. Nice, nice lad. Um, I remember his first game, I think, actually was. I might be wrong here, but I think we went on an end-of-season tour to uh, Mexico, and I think it was the Azteca, and uh, I made a couple of goals for him in that, in that, in that game, and uh, his movement was, was really, really good, and I loved playing with him. He, was, uh, he knew where a midfield player wanted to, to put the ball, and he'd make them movements, but excellent player, and um, scored so many goals, didn't he, for Chelsea, and uh, a, a, a wonderful striker. England was something which every schoolboy dreams of, you know, playing for your country. It was uh, one of the great days when I made my full debut in the Aztec. I'd come on a sub against Mexico for 15 minutes in the pre-World Cup tour in 85. Bobby Robson gave me the opportunity and I thank him for that. Um, I got eight caps and I'm so proud of them eight caps. You know, there was about 20 strikers um, who I believe were all quality players. Um, you know, throughout the time we all got England caps, uh, are all vying for a place in the England squad. And, you know, people talk about would they get in today? The majority of them players would be in and around the England team, certainly in the squad, if you mention any of their names. And, you know, they certainly would. Um, and without going through them all, you know, th th there's plenty. Um, Woodcock, Mariner started off, Trevor Francis, you know, uh, Gary Lineker, Peter Beardsley, Mark Haight, they all, all, all got caps. The competition would have been Ian Wright, um, Tony Cotty, Clive Allen. There's so many people that you know got caps in and around that time, and all good quality strikers. Um, I'm proud of my eight caps. Gary Lineker, you had Peter Beardsley, Mark Haightley, you had Barnsley, you had lots of players, lots of good, good strikers there, and uh, he would have had more caps if it had been, say, uh, in a different era. Yeah, which is sure. And standing in that Aztec Stadium, listening to the national anthem from here on in on the Panini stickers or whatever the young boys or children collected to put in their soccer books, it was going to be Kerry Dixon, Chelsea in England. And a uh, wonderful moment. What does the player think about when the national anthem strikes up? Do you think about your family, your parents, the long road that it's taken you to get here? <laughs> how, how, what goes through no. your head at that moment? I want to play well, I want to score a goal, 
um, and that was the next thing, next agenda, score for England. Scored two on the debut against uh, West Germany and wonderful result. It was stuff dreams are made of and you know I'll never forget every, every player has their dreams, every, everyone's got different ideas, every, different wishes, but uh, it happened for me and uh, I was so pleased. I wanted to score at Wembley. It was one of the places, you know, playing there. Got the opportunity in a World Cup qualifier against Northern Ireland. And the press had made hay of a situation previously. I'll break Pat's heart, I think was one of the headlines. And I didn't actually say that. I said I wanted to score. And, you know, if I'd have scored and England would have won, the Northern Irish wouldn't have gone to the World Cup. But you have to be a little bit selfish at the time. You know, I wanted to score. I was in a battle for a position a place in the England squad and to remain there and I wanted to score at Wembley. It wasn't to be Pat pulled off a wonderful save from a header. Um, I thought I'd scored, headed it back across the goal. As you say, Alan McDonald was there. He claims, or he did afterwards, that he would have headed it, but he was coming this way. And, but somehow, I think Pat got a couple of fingertips to it and tipped it over the bar. Wonderful save from a wonderful keeper. I can remember that quite well because uh... In fact, Alan McDonald was behind me on the line. It was a header from Kerry, and Alan McDonald was behind me on the line, late Alan McDonald, and I thought he was going to handle it before I got to it, thinking I wasn't going to get there. But uh, thankfully, he didn't touch it, and I managed to get back and get a handle and get it over the bar. Wasn't to be. Um, I think it was probably the nearest I'd come to scoring a goal at Wembley the time I played there. But uh, that's one of them situations. In 1983, Kerry Dixon signed for Chelsea, along with a handful of other new players. But no one at the club could have expected the season to go just as well as it did. When I first came, there were six players, or well, five other players, joined with me to make a total of six in that summer of 83. And uh, the first game was against Derby, which was... Uh, a side which was fancied to win the league under Peter Taylor, the formerly Brian Clough's assistant. And we were something like a 25 to 1 shot, having just stayed in the third division, courtesy of a Clive Walker goal away at Bolton. So to actually beat them 5 0 was great, and to get a couple was, was even better. The Spackman, Speedy, Nevin, Dixon side was the, the original one, 1983 side. And, you know, Eddie Nizveski, wonderful goalkeeper, Joe McLaughlin come there. Colin Pates was still there with, alongside Johnny Bumpsid from previous seasons. And, no, it was, a, it was a very good team. I think, you know, we took everyone by surprise, um, getting promotion and winning the second division first time round. And equipping ourselves very well in the first division, which is now the Premier League, of course. Um, and proving that uh, lots of players in that side were worthy of an international um, cap one way or another and quite a few of them getting them. In those days, in the 80s, it was really a two-man partnership for a lot of clubs. Liverpool were famous for it as well, United had two up front. But you and, and David Speedy, you were just so different, weren't you? What, what he could do well, you weren't so good, and what he wasn't so good that you could absolutely master. Well, very much so. We, we, you know, we were very compatible in terms of a partnership. And you're quite right, you know, you look at the partnerships and the great partnerships, Liverpool with uh, Russian Dalglish, McAvenny and Cotty at West Ham, mm. you know, Lineker, Sharp, Everton, some great partnerships. And, um, you know, it was pretty much a sign of the times that lots of teams would play the formation 4, 4-4-2. Four, four, um, it was the, the way that English football was being played at the time. And, listen, I still see nothing wrong with it. And Pat Nevin himself, he created a, a lot of chances, quite a mercurial winger, very skillful. And, you know, the likes of Mickey Thomas was on the other side, Clive Walker for a period, Paul Cannaville for a period. Um, but it was a very well-balanced side. A lot of the time you didn't have to look where he was. You would kind of know where he'd go because he'd go to where the space was. So if you went to a certain area, he would trap the back post. He would beat anyone in there from the back post. If I was coming from a deeper area, I knew that it would come short and then go beyond and no one was quick enough to stay with Kerry. So if you put the ball in the right place, it would end up almost certainly in the back of the net, at the very least. 
they take an amazing save from the goalkeeper. Um, Gary's touch, you wouldn't argue, was the best touch in the world in general playing a game. Put him in front of a goal, and he was utterly world class with his touch. I mean, utterly world class. It's amazing when we speak to Chelsea fans today how they'll come up to you and say, I remember that cross you put in for Pat Nevin to score a header. I remember the goal you scored against West Ham. Like it, like it was yesterday, you know, 30 years ago. And the, the supporters have not forgotten how the goals went in and how you scored them. That's quite incredible, really. No, the support I've always uh, received from, from Chelsea's fans has been absolutely magnificent um, and still is. Yeah, sure, many of them who still go um, remember and grew up in the time when that 80s side were playing, uh, playing their trade down here. And, you know, they pass on their memories to the newer fans who then obviously go on computers or social media and various outlets and look it up and say, hmm, it wasn't too bad. And that's the sort of stuff that they grew up on. And, and why should they forget it, you know? Um, many of the newer fans will be looking at the Didier Drogba perhaps and the, the, the Franco Zolas and the the Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbanks, Idiga Johnson times, and you know they'll be looking at that, and, and that was their their time. But uh, all over, Chelsea Football Club is is a family, and you know you, you part, you become part of that family, if you are part of that family. Um, I would also like to think that I would be part, and am treated so. Um, the fans make it that way. Um, the football club will always be here. Different people have come, different people have gone. The owners are great now and I have to say, you know, some would differ. The owner then, Ken Bates, it, it, I, felt, I felt he was great as well. And the more recent history is what Chelsea fans deserve. You know, European Cup finals, winners medals, league titles, doubles. It's all part of what they deserved and it's, and it's a credit to Roman that he's made that happen for them uh, at a club that I believe football supporters who, who supported throughout them times and still remember fully deserve. I'm proud of my football career and I'm glad it happened the way it happened at a club that I've grown to love and uh, it's reciprocated um, certainly through the terraces and you know it's made a life very special for me. Even when I was coming through he was a big legend at the football club a uh, fantastic ambassador for the football club as well, what he achieved, uh, the goal scoring records, but also a great man as well. You know, someone who welcomed me when I was coming through the ranks and a big part of that kind of developing. And it's, it's still great to see him around the club as well. What he achieved is adored by the fans as well. You know, I look back at kind of old videos, it still gives me goosebumps kind of watching his goal scoring and, you know, the work ethic and everything he, he stood for as a, as a footballer. Um, but as I said before, more importantly, he's, you know, he's been around the football club ever since I've come through. And then figureheads as well from the old players, you know, Roman's kind of welcomed them back to the football club, which is fantastic. Um, and we hope that they continue to be around the football club for many more years to come. We'd love to have played against each other, um, different gen generations, unfortunately. But listen, a fantastic player, um, quick, dynamic, you know, just a fantastic ability to always be in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, as I said before, absolutely adored by the fans. And, and rightly so as well, because them, them legends as well, what they achieved you know, at different generations at the football club, mean an awful lot. And they set, they set the benchmark for, the, for everyone else coming to the football club. One of your favourite games, actually not for Chelsea, but when you moved on, playing against Chelsea, Luton, Wembley, the semi-final of the, of the FA Cup. A Luton boy playing for the team that you, you always wanted to play for, against the team that you loved for nine years. What were the emotions at that day at Wembley for you? Well, the day at Wembley, Chelsea made it so special for me. The emotions were I wanted to get to a cup final, I'd never been to one. Um, it would have been fantastic with Luton Town. Um, it was a wonderful cup run with a very good side under David Pleat, put together and some famous victories. Um, people, you know, Scott Oakes was sort of made his name, a young John Hartson coming through. And, you know, Paul Telfer had a good career. Um, David Priest, sadly a very good friend of mine who, who died, very good player. Um, it was a good side. But on the day, we, we never performed and Chelsea were worthy winners. But So at the end of it, I was, Dennis Wise came over to me and he, Dennis was my room partner for three years, my last three at Chelsea. And Dennis is first and said, unlucky wig, which is what he used to call me. <laughs> and um, 
but Chelsea fans, he said, listen to that. And Chelsea fans were singing, there's only one Kerry Dixon and it was amazing. It was the most amazing footballing experience I've probably ever had, um, including playing. I mean, playing for England was absolutely magnificent, standing there listening to the national anthem in the Aztec Stadium. But to hear the amount of Chelsea fans who were going to Wembley for a cup final, singing my name, a player from the opposition, was something which will live with me forever and, it, and it, it's quite an amazing experience and I'll never forget it. You know, for some football fans may not know what you experience on the field, what you can hear from the crowd. That was after the game but that certainly was a heartfelt emotion and it stayed with you all this time, hasn't it? Yeah, it's something I'll never forget. You know, Chelsea fans have been fantastic towards me. Uh, current fans, old, old fans. They've all tried to help in their own way in, in various situations and, and they still do. And I still, and I will, find the time and the opportunity to chat, meet up, talk about the old times, about when I played and, and before and since. You know, and Roman Abramovich has come in and given them fans the opportunity to experience European Cups away days in Europe, two or three days, wonderful nights in Europe. You know. Money is the key to football, without doubt. But them fans deserve that. The people who stood there, the 15,000 that possibly turned up on that first day at Derby and before, you know, they're still coming to the games. They deserve these European nights and I'm so pleased for them that this situation has happened with the club and we're now one of the biggest clubs in the world um, because of that. And, but they don't forget the old times um, and they're still having the beauty of what they're having now. Some of them still say that They'll never forget and still experience some of the away days at Grimsby, even Shrewsbury, some of the more darker ones when we lost away in the League Cup on a poor night and they spent three hours coming back, getting got to get up for work in the morning. Things like that should never be forgotten and uh, it won't be forgotten by me. Um, I'm now one of them. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation that people put themselves through. They devote themselves to their club and players should respect that. And there are players that do, but there's quite a few that should sit back and have a little think about what supporters actually put in and uh, in terms of time and money. Growing up as a kid, Kerry Dixon always wanted to be a footballer, scoring goals, lots of them, at the biggest venues in the world. As a schoolboy I just wanted to play as high as the highest level I could and score as many goals as I could for whoever and be a success. There, is, there are things there that are unfulfilled. I never scored at Wembley. There are regrets, there are situations which obviously would have done differently. Should have stayed at Chelsea. Um, it didn't happen. Did you have a chance to stay at Chelsea? Or were you I'm not sure. Time? Um, I had three and a half years on a contract. I could have sat it out. I could, I could have gone in the reserves for the first six months. Who's to say the team would have, whoever they brought in, wouldn't have done so good? I might have been challenging, scoring goals in the reserves. Who, who knows? Uh, you don't know. Um, but as I say, life seems to be cast. Situations will change the route. My route changed, and I went on to have some wonderful experiences. Of course left Chelsea, went to Southampton, and from Southampton, which it didn't work out, wonderful place, wonderful people, but it, in terms of football it didn't work out, went to Luton and experienced that wonderful semi-final. Mm. And I got the opportunity to play for my hometown club, something which is fulfilment, if you like, a dream that I, dre that I dreamt of as that schoolboy, to play for Luton. I wanted to do it. It was, it was your club, I, be I used to believe, and still probably believe, although football's gone global in terms of money and, and, and support, but I used to believe supporters should support your local club. That's how it used to be when I grew up. Do you believe in fate that you were destined to go down that route of moving from Chelsea and Southampton? To Chelsea Reading? seemed, when I had the opportunity at Reading, the club that drew me to it, Ken Bates, uh, the name Chelsea, I remember you know, the 1970 Cup final, Peter Osgood, Dave Webb, I remember it, um, beating Leeds, the Giants and the site. It was something about Chelsea when they were in, providing the details were right, which they were, it was always going to be Chelsea. Even now, 30 odd years afterwards, you're a massive fan's favourite. What do you think 
apart from scoring 193 goals, which helps. Yeah. But what do you think made you the fans' favourite that some of the other players of that team and squad don't enjoy? Well, um, I suppose nine years at the club. Um, that also helps. But I think also you get out what you put into the to the football game. And, you know, you look at the Gerrards, you look at the Carragers at, up the north, you look at the Nevilles, if you like, at Manchester, or Gary Neville, certainly. You look at Giggs, you look at Chelsea's JT, Frank Lampard, you know, um, Didier Drogba. You look at people who basically devote the majority of their time and their football career to one club. They get out from that club what, they, what I believe they put in. And it's not just a case of playing for them a long time. It's a case of having a rapport, having time for the supporters, having time for fans, having time for people, having time to sign autographs. If a, if, a, if a person wants to wait out for an hour for you to sign an autograph, you should have the decency um, to sign that autograph. And if there's 10 people, sign all 10. Um, if there's a little bit of a bugbear, one or two modern players need to take a leaf out of certain players' books, and I'm not talking about me, but you want something out of it. Don't bother with the headphones and the hood and, all, and walk past all the mobile phone. Sign the autographs. It's, a, it's an important part of uh, what you get back from the fans. And as I say, you only get out what you put in. Um, I, if an opportunity was there and someone wanted an autograph, I'd be only too happy to oblige and still am. And I think that's uh, respected from the fans. And I think that's one of the main reasons why I'm always treated so well at Chelsea. Kerry Dixon scored goals just about everywhere he played, including 193 for Chelsea and four for England. Terry Butcher robs a defender, he tries to go around Schumacher. I thought I'd get up there in support and luckily enough for me I did because he got a hand to it, the keeper, and nearly pushed it underneath my foot, as you can see. Um, ball going in off the post. That most amazing moment, first ever England goal. And I nearly missed it. <laughs> the keeper got a hand to there and it squirted under my foot. I had to dig it out a little bit. And for it, there was, I've got to be honest, for a moment I thought it might have missed, but it didn't. Here, John Barnes does brilliant down the wing. Sends over a peach of a cross. Um, this is what I was talking about. You know, the art of heading the ball. Schumacher there went to come far post. It was pretty much a trademark header. I always say head him down. But in that situation, with the defender there, head it back across him. This was the Arsenal goal, something you'll never see again. My favourite goal of all time. Pat Jennings saved the first one. There's the delight. And behind is something which is quite incredible, something I don't think you'll see again. Chelsea supporters there in the, in the clock end was quite incredible. And they were all up the sides, both sides. You can see me looking there as I run back. Doug Rugby takes a kick, Speedo wins the header or they both miss it. Swung with the left, Pat Jennings once again down, makes a good save. But I struck it sweet with me right and uh, Kenny Sansom couldn't stop it on the line. Yeah, another header, ball played in. Dimitri Karin, I think that was in goal. Um, it was against Spurs, getting across the front. Always love to score against Spurs. Chelsea and Spurs have a big rivalry. The ball coming in this time, just getting across the front of the defender and glancing it in. Ball's being contested, but once again, ball played into the space. Something which love to do, Manchester United away. Got the goal, got the opportunity. I think that was in the first couple of minutes. We end up winning 1-0 up there. And uh, Tony Gordon, I think, saved a, couple, saved a couple of penalties. Here, I think this was one of a four I scored at home. Just rounding the keeper, just doing enough. It doesn't really matter how goals go in. You know, people say that was a great goal, this was a poor goal. I've never seen a poor goal. The goal's a goal. Um, it was, this is a, one of the best goals I scored. Because I'm predominantly right-footed, received the ball back to goal, turned left footer, curled it. Incidentally, my last goal for Chelsea was a left-footed curler. That was away at Norwich, not to be seen here, but as I say, Chelsea fans all played in, turned away, saw the space, the opportunity for a, for a strike. Something my dad always said, if the opportunity is there, 
Don't worry if it's on the left. Swing the left and it goes in. Another goal in the same game. Um, this was a, once again, far post header. I fancied myself jumping at the far post and, you know, that's players who played alongside me knew where I'd be. During his nine years at Chelsea, large gambling debts mounted up and unable to pay himself, Chairman Ken Bates helped carry out on more than one occasion. Did you realise at the time that you had some kind of gambling problem or was it for you, you were just unlucky and you weren't getting any winners and you were losing all the time? Like most oh, I was always unlucky in terms of, I mean, and I realised I had a gambling problem at the age of 12, I think it was, when I got suspended from school for gambling for dinner tickets. You know, that was the way it was. Um, something which obviously affected my life and it affected my footballing life but I've had a life I'm not going to be I'm not going to moan about it um, the life is what it is and I pass on my experiences um, to my children I hope they would listen and you know and I tell everyone else you know don't be like me um, don't end up like me I had the opportunity and it didn't it, I didn't take it people should listen to that and you know, it's advice from someone who's, who's been through the mill, had, had it, lost it, and now has to rebuild his life. But uh, I will rebuild, and to whatever level. I'll never get to the where I was before. I, I, you know, I don't doubt that. Were you happier than at the level you were before money-wise? Um, it didn't change me, I don't no. think. I, I, I really don't think it did. All it was was I had more money and I spent more money. Now, I haven't got enough money and I wish I had more to spend on something. But you make do with what you've got and you get by. Life doesn't stop, it just keeps going on. And you live for the next day, and you live for the next day, then it's the next week, and you try and make sure you don't make the same mistakes again. And uh, that's what I'm doing at the moment. When you were helped out the first time by Chelsea, did you ever think, really, I better stop this, or I better reduce my mistakes, or... Oh, is, is, that what, is that what people think when, when you're in that... In that kind of moment of, I've got to get a win, I've got to get another I've, win. I've reduced loads of times, I've stopped loads of times. I stop, I start, I stop, I start. Um, it was just something that is there. Um, pressures, all sorts of problems. Get out of it, sort it out, make it work. However, as I say, life goes on and problems don't go away unless you make them go away. And You know, I'm a determined person. And it's up to me to sort it out, and that's what I do. I sort, I sort out the problems. It's me that created them, and it's me that has to deal with them. Greater players than me have fallen by the wayside from a greater height. And, you know, you can't tell them that their greatness is their greatness, and their fall is, is a more spectacular one. Mine was and is what it is. Um, it really is, you know, some people went to the racetrack, some people become scratch golfers, some people went to the snooker hall. Some people went home and sat in the afternoon and watched telly or went shopping. It's whatever they did. Mm -hmm. um, some people went on to start businesses and become successful businessmen. As I say, the DNA is cast as far as I was concerned and I think it's for most people. Um, pressures in and around or choices affect it. Um, I made some wrong decisions. You stayed in the game quite a, a while after the Southampton and Luton. Was that by choice? It really, from your book, it, you, you, can, you always wanted to carry on playing football, but did, did you sort of have to carry on playing football? Well, you can, whether you have to or otherwise, um, I always wanted to. The competitive edge has never stopped. I played non-league football up until about the age of 45. I was playing on Sunday mornings with St Joseph's, a, a local side, a very good side. That's because being fit and wanting to play, um, but the aches and pains didn't go away and they become more, every time we had a game, it took me three days to recover um, and I ached and, and when you have an injury, it could be a month to recover, like a hamstring or something, but I still wanted to play. Um, having to play, well, yes, but I didn't play Sunday mornings for money. 
I played Sunday mornings for the love of the game. He was so well liked as well by the fans, but by the team as well. Yeah. You know, and look at it now, Kerry's it's one of these guys, whatever happens with Kerry, there's a lot of us think there's not a bad bone in that guy's body. Yeah. And that's the thing that we all stick by Kerry for. But it wasn't smiles all round at Chelsea when Kerry clashed with his striking partner, David Speedy. David's a good friend of mine, but it wasn't always that way. He, um, he used to come in with Colin Lee, who was a, a striker um, at the club as well, a good striker. Uh, they were friends and they used to travel in and it was pretty much a case of myself and Colin had started the season and it started off pretty good um, as a team. And the team were going well, David weren't inside. Um, he got himself into the team after I think about five or six games and when he replaced Colin, um, John Neal probably made the decision. Um, David played well as well, the team continued to win. But for some reason there was a bit of resentment, you know, towards me, possibly from the pair of them. Um, and David showed it a lot on the field and he reckons I didn't pass to him and, you know, it was a constant sort of bickering and things like that. But, you know, uh, when you get to know David, you actually understand that that was his way. Um, it wasn't necessarily that case. That, it, he would moan at anyone, uh, but I didn't take too kindly to it. In one game, we, I snapped and um, we had a few fisticuffs in the dressing room after the game. Manchester City, we both swung for each other. Um, John Neal, the lads broke it up and it was sort of saying, hey, what's going on, you know? And um, John Neal pulled us both in the office after we've had a shower and he, he effectively said that, you know, he feels we're a good pairing. He's the manager, he picks the team. And us two are both going to be playing in the foreseeable future. He doesn't see any reason to change it. So shake hands and, and, and move on and get used to the fact you're going to be playing together and hopefully we'll go on and do something this season. Sure enough, we did exactly that and uh, our partnership evolved and our friendship evolved with it. And uh, David's one of my best friends in football and you know we had a, a great partnership and it was one of the best partnerships, if not the best, I've ever had. Every sportsman has a hobby, and for Kerry Dixon, it was horse racing. If I went to the racetrack, I wouldn't be one of these standing by the bar. I'll be, I'll be looking at the, trying to get the winner of the next race, and looking at the paddock, looking at the parade ring, uh, and so on. Um, you know, drinking becomes something which people attributed to me later on, and I actually don't believe that. I drunk any more excessively than perhaps a normal person, although when it got to a session I, I would be in there with the majority of them and, and would drink, but I wouldn't have said drinking would be one of uh, my issues. The mindset is cast in your DNA, I do believe that, you know, I think um, peer pressures and surrounding issues would obviously affect that, but um, I, I actually think that, you know, the way you are is, is what's inside you and you can develop it or you can ignore the dark sides if you like. Sadly for me the, the niggling dark side kept coming through in, in, in other areas. No one's perfect and you know sometimes in life you, you t take wrong decisions and I've taken like everyone else um, one or two wrong decisions. Kerry Dixon made many friends throughout his career but he also made a few enemies an early morning police drugs raid whilst he was still lying in bed is proof of that. Drug raid, police come through the door, he's in handcuffs before you knew it. Um, searching the house for drugs. Um, the only time I'd ever bothered with drugs as far as that's concerned is at the pub when it started, you know. And, um, they were saying I was dealing drugs or something, someone had Tip, they got acting from a reliable source, so I was the absolute rubbish as far as I was concerned, and it turned out to be absolute rubbish. Um, but nevertheless, um, it happened, um, disappointing, and it was paraded all over the press. Um, that's the way it is, uh, whether it be right or wrong, it happened. Um, there's nothing I could do about it. As I say, you, you deal with these things, um, and I deal with it, it, it happened. 
I, I don't know what else to say. It, it happened. Went in the nick for a day. Charges remained, and then they dropped the charges. And then you just carry on with your life again? Well, not really, because it leaves you open to a situation. And I did have a drink. We, myself and Kim were going down to a pub a week later when someone's going, you the drug dealer? And he was obviously had a few. He was out with his mates on the beer. We stayed in the pub a couple of hours, and next thing this fella come along and said what he said to me. I lost my temper and whacked him and ended up getting done for GBH. The conviction meant that Kerry Dixon lost his freedom. He was about to pay a high price for his error. And after the guilty verdict was reached, he was sentenced to nine months in prison. This fellow was particularly rude, looking for trouble. Um, and his mate, he tried to glass me later on, something which was ruled out in court. My actions were wrong. I won't put myself in them situations again, or I'll try not to. Um, I won't be out in pubs drinking at that time. The need to drink, if indeed there was one, won't happen again. And if I see a situation, I'll just walk away from it. Um, but the places I go these days, it wouldn't happen. But it, 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 I'm not going to say it taught me a lesson. It, it taught me if I wanted to rebuild my life and I was going along, perhaps the road I was going down needed a, a jolt. Um, it, was, it was a jolt which, quite a big jolt, to actually end up first, first offence in prison. But maybe whoever cast the DNA decided that I needed a jolt at the time, and uh, I got it, and I have learned from it. I'd like to sit, kind of get to know how you felt walking into court when, when you knew the judge was going to make a decision. I'd actually been to probationary reports prior to, and the lady at probation said to me she's going to recommend community service to the judge. And I said, well, how does the judge actually listen to community reports and reports from the probation service? And they said, well, usually. So it was a little bit of a shock. I actually had a hearing and I, couldn't, I didn't hear the sentence. My son told me and, and the guard sitting next to me that you've got nine months. That was it. And how did you feel then? Well, it wasn't great. Um, it, it, everyone thinks you should think, oh, what happens now? I was quite aware there's a possibility of a custodial sentence. Um, and I'm certainly not thinking that I should be immune to that situation at all. As I say, it happened to me. Um, I ended up doing four. The experience of being inside is not one that I would want for myself ever again. And I'd certainly offer advice to anyone to deter them from getting into a situation whereby, if indeed that could happen to them, stay away from it. You look at the situation for people, we're all in there, we are, because I was a con and, you know, have been a con. And you're in there for a reason. And the stories that you hear and, you know, how you have to live your life is a jolt to every person who walks the planet until they've experienced that. Life inside. You go from playing for Chelsea, 193 goals, playing for Reading, Luton, Southampton, playing for England, to do what, what, do, what the prisoners get to do in prison, what, what's the task involved there? Well, it's rock bottom as far as what it is, but the prison service is designed f for a reason and they make improvements and, you know, they probably will still try and make improvements. Um, the stories of it's a party and having a great time, it's easy. Well, it's not easy at all. It's boring. Um, you work to get out of your cell. The alternative is to stay in the cell don't work, don't do anything, you come out, have your dinner and go back in your cell. Of which there's two bunks, maybe three on the latter two, two months of my sentence. Uh, you have a television, um, so big, between two or three of you. You have a toilet, which is basically an open toilet, so 
you're exposed to your cellmates, if you like. Um, and that's the way you live. I trained every day. I lost a stone. I was fitter because of it. Obviously, you train every day. Um, but it was, it was boring and I couldn't wait to get out. I couldn't wait to get back to the family. I spoke to Kim, my son, mum and dad on a fairly regular basis. I had visits from friends, PFA, Bobby Barnes, Perry Groves came to visit, Les, Mick, all my good friends, Eddie Woods, um, along with Kim and Joe, who came on a regular basis, uh, and mum and dad, and my sister Jane, of course. You lived for the little things in life, the visits, of which you got three a month. So it's one week for an hour. You get to see people who you love. Um, but you live for that. The two days gearing up for a visit, I've got a visit. And it was disappointing. When you get become an enhanced prisoner, you get four or five visits a month, which means you become enhanced for good behaviour after three months. I served four months of the nine month sentence. So the last month or so, I was regarded privileged. But when I first went in there, England, Chelsea, Luton, Southampton, didn't mean a thing. I was a con the same as everyone else. Love of family always helps. And the way we were brought up, it will always be there. Um, for right or for wrong. My family still love me um, because of, not because of the stint, because of me. They've, they've all expressed disappointment and quite rightly so, in the fact that this situation has happened and my life has led me to be where I am. And I don't blame them one bit, but you know, they have belief in the fact that I'm trying to turn things around and, and going in the right direction and, and trying to pull it round. Um, and they actually have belief that it will happen and it will happen. How much pressure is on you then as a person to deliver that belief? Oh, it's still on pressure is still on, um, but I will deliver. Um, I said to you earlier on, the DNA is cast, and uh, when I put my mind to something, it will happen. Get to know people first. That's one of the things if I was ever going to pass on a tip to someone. Get to know them before you make a judgment, and if you feel that way, then so be it. And that's how I would like people to think of me. Get to know me. And if you don't like me, then I'd be quite happy for someone to point out why in a respectable manner and, and take it on board. Do you think we, people criticise too often these days? It's too easy I to criticise. I think we're born in, in a world that criticism... Um, we look for a, a reason to criticise every radio show you hear, every um, TV show that's put together. They want someone to criticise and someone to argue with. That's, they call that great television, great radio. It's the society we live in, criticism. They, they make, make arguments, create controversy. Um, yes, everyone judges. And but all I would say is, on people, judges you find. Because it's not always what appears. And what would you say to the, the youngsters these days, the footballers coming through, to how to avoid those risks? Is it, uh, is it just really concentrate on your trade? Yeah, but you know, you talk about concentrate on your trade, young footballers. They're young men, first and foremost. People say they've got the opportunity to become privileged and if they're chasing their dream, they should give themselves every opportunity to do that. But they're still going to be young men and they're going to make mistakes. There isn't a person on this planet who hasn't made a mistake, that's for sure. Anyone who sits watching it, anyone who thinks they haven't, need to have a little check and they say, oh, well, possibly that's a mistake, possibly it isn't. But who's judging the mistakes? Who says it's a mistake? The biggest judge is the self. I have a belief, like I've already said, I will get somewhere, wherever it's going to be, and all of these things and people that have helped me and been part of, I'm not going to say a struggle, part of my life, I will reciprocate one way or another to them, and that is something that will happen as well. Their belief and faith in me and, and indeed their help, and uh, that will be repaid one day in a manner which I can do and I haven't forgotten. And is this the hardest task that you've ever had to 
give that belief back to your, your family, your loved ones that you can do. It's not a hard task. It's, a, it's hard getting to the task. The task has been set. Um, it is something that I'm determined to do. Um, every day is hard, but that changes. Doors open, things happen, people will make judgments. Um, it is a person, if people want to look at my life, who had it, lost it, through his own means, will fight back and steady the ship. And if people want to take a leave, young footballers if you like, and look at what can happen, what did happen and what might happen, they can pick up the phone and I'll be there. Even though the sun has set on his career as a professional footballer, Kerry still manages to help many different charities with some of his former teammates by playing in a variety of legends tournaments around the world. I never say you can never predict what the future ain't, what the future is. I mean, who would have thought as a kid I would be a footballer? Who would have thought I would play for England? Who would have thought I, I would end up in prison when I was playing for England? You, you know. You just couldn't predict what's going to happen. What I would like to happen um, is for me to get back on a level peg in, in life, which I'm heading in the right direction, get back working for Chelsea, working at Chelsea, um, which was where I was before, um, keeping my head down, making sure the rest of my life goes the way I want it to go, and uh, continue to make people happy and to be happy myself. Can you imagine a life without football? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I mean, football's been part of me now from, for quite a long time. Uh, life without football in some capacity uh, would be a whole new ball game, totally different. Um, so no, you know, somewhere along the line I'd have to fit into football. Hopefully it'll be where I want to be.